Hi everyone, Dave Tibbs from Oakland Puzzle Company here, and in today's video, we're gonna hear from Jean Dominique, the photographer behind our puzzle, 59 Rue de Rivoli, available now at oaklandpuzzle.com and select stores throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Do you wanna support the work that we're doing here? Hit the like button on this video below. Leave a comment and let us know what you found interesting about it. Share the video with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, we really appreciate it. Recently, I sat down with Gene to talk to him about his life as a photographer and the photo that became the puzzle, 59 Rue de Rivoli. Here's what he had to say. Hi, Gene, welcome to our YouTube channel. How are you? Hey, Dave, good. How are you? Good, good. It's great to see you again. Um, so, of course, we'd like to talk about the puzzle and the image, which we're all super excited about um, and our customers are really excited about as well. Uh, but first, we should get to know you as an artist a little bit more. Um, I know you got your art degree uh, from San Jose State right here in the Bay Area. Uh, sorry, photojournalism degree. Yeah, photojournalism. Right. Um, so then you became an attorney. Um, and while you were an attorney, were you still involved in photography? No, actually, I put uh, the camera down in 1980, and I didn't pick up a camera again until 2015, give or take. Um, I do, you know, what I I, uh, I freelanced for four or five years around Silicon Valley, Santa Clara Valley back then. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, I had a young family and I, I just I couldn't make a go of it. I couldn't couldn't really make um, a living doing freelance and couldn't get a gig at a, a newspaper. Um, so I decided to go back to school and it was either going to be business school or law school. And, you know, you flip a coin and 30 years later, it turned out not to be a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I know that uh, all of the attorneys that I've ever known would not have enough free time for a hobby or a side business or anything like like photography or something. So I'm guessing you found yourself in that situation as well. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really. Um, you know, I turned my back on it uh, for a long time and uh, I sort of got interested in it <clears throat> around 2015, give or take when um, I started to think about retirement um, and, you know, what happens next? Because I, I don't feel like uh, those of us who are retiring now do it the way our parents did. And so rather than buying a Barco lounger, I tried to figure out what I was going to do in the next act. And um, uh, it, it became, you know, more and more apparent that um, I was being drawn back into photography. And so I just followed that, um, you know, pulled that string and just followed it to wherever it was going to take me. Yeah. And do you feel like you have changed as a photographer in that, how long did you say, 30 years? Um. Well, yeah, th I mean, 30 years without doing photography, but always thinking about it, always reading about it. I just didn't have the, the time, you know, I just didn't have a time um was working long hours weekends all that stuff so the brain space was was just not it was not a conducive time to try to do photography for a long time but um I was always thinking about it um I traveled a lot for work I traveled a lot in my personal life and um you know if I could always find a photo gallery or a photo museum um I'd make time for that so it was it was there it was percolating in the background but I wasn't actively involved because I just didn't have, you know, the time. So Right. Do you think all of that life experience made you a better photographer? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think what really has um, helped me as a photographer um, is, is, is getting back into it and doing the work, making images, um, you know, that whole, think about 10,000 hours. I mean, I think I've, I put in my time. Um, the, the, the stuff I learned early on was great technical, you know, a great technical background. Um, I, I worked in a dark room um, as a printer for a long time. So that was pretty invaluable. 
But I think actually when I came back to photography, just just putting in the time, making images, making crappy images and trying to make better images and, you know, looking at other people's work and, you know, stealing other people's imagery and copying what I thought was was interesting um, until I sort of developed my own um, style. And um, yeah, it was, it, you know, there's no way, there's no shortcut. You got to do the work. You just got, and in my case, you got to make images, you know. Yeah, well, you've also done a lot of work as a volunteer, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. You started a really neat donation program to get cameras and camera gear into the hands of underserved youth, and you've served on a couple of boards. Um, can you tell mm -hmm. us your a little bit about your history around volunteerism and um, just kind of your feelings about that role that it plays in your life? It's uh, super important in my life, and it started with um, the Berkeley Camera Club. I, I joined Berkeley Camera Club when I was still working as a way to start to do the transition back into photography. And after a few years, um, I joined their board, uh, and I was the secretary and maybe another position for a while. But I was on uh, the board of Berkeley Camera Club, Club and then that led to... Um, a short stint, about a year, um, at the Berkeley Arts Center there up on Rose Street. Um, and then I transitioned onto the board of San Francisco Camera Work, uh, where I just finished my third year term in um, June, the end of June this year, um, sort of coinciding with, with our relocation. But my, my practice is divided between actually making imagery and and doing volunteer work. I just think that it's, you know, very important um, for a simple reason. I have the time and and I have the resources. And so, um, you know, if I can volunteer in a space that makes sense uh, for me in the art space and in the photography space, um, I feel compelled to do what I have. My legal background sort of um, helps um, you know, navigate these issues that come up on boards. And so that's, it's useful um, and uh, not a very heavy lift in terms of, uh, you know, the, the issues that come up, but uh, it's, a, it's a valuable thing to do. And then Camera Angels came out of a simple recognition back in the day, um, back in the day of um, photography magazines, right? So, you know, everybody's subscribing to these, these magazines and the magazines tell you, if you buy a new camera, you'll make better pictures. And they tell you that month after month after month. And what I learned is my friends and colleagues would have these uh, barely used, barely touched cameras in closets and in garages because they kept upgrading, 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 trying to, you know, make the better imagery. And I don't know if that worked, but it it allowed me to go and say, you know, I know some kids who don't have a camera and I know you have some stuff in your closet um, that they could use. So let's do a win-win thing. Um, so I would, I went around Berkeley and Oakland collecting gear from people that I knew. And then it became, um, you know, word of mouth. Um, I'd get calls and emails. Hey, I got some stuff for you. Um, and I started with Berkeley High. I started donating things uh, to Berkeley High because that's where I went to high school. And um, I donated some stuff to some young people in San Francisco. And uh, it just kind of, you know, took off and, and grew from there. I had to stop when we moved here to Atlanta and I don't know what, uh, you know, I'm going to do now that I'm here, but um, it was pretty cool. I, I donated hundreds and hundreds of cameras um, and gear and related gear. It, it, it became, you know, kind of comical. People would have, you know, it, it was um, a, a little bit of uh, a, a diamond every now and then. And then a whole lot of stuff that I have to say, nah, yeah. I, I'm really not a recycling uh, right. operation. I, yeah. I need to have stuff that works, you know. Exactly. That kind of thing, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was um, very useful to to get these things to young folks. So, yeah, uh, you must have some really good stories from that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I do. I do. So you recently moved to Atlanta, like you just mentioned. Um, yeah. Do you miss Oakland terribly? You know, I miss Oakland. I miss my friends and colleagues um, a lot, um, but I don't feel like it's it's. Um, 
it's different now with social media and you know easy access to people um with uh you know whatsapp and and texting and all that kind of stuff it's different than it would have been to do this 30 years ago that would have been like a sort of a bright line cutoff back in the day but now um you know you can still stay in touch with people and I've been back to Oakland once for a show opening. And um, so I, I I miss my friends. I just miss my friends, you know? Right, right. Um, I'm sure that you're very missed here as well. And uh, we wish that we had you here now that we're getting to know you and, and working with you. But uh, we're, we're really excited about it. So, um, yeah, so it sounds like you're kind of jumping into the photography community in Atlanta. And what are you up to currently? now in Atlanta? Um, I found um, a group called the Atlanta Photography Group that um, is doing a lot of good work in the volunteer space here in town. Um, I became a member. Um, I had a show with them earlier this summer. And so, I'm, you know, I'm looking for my my place here and, and, you know, this whole idea of getting in where you fit in. I'm still trying to figure that out, but um, making some acquaintances and, you um, it's trying to make the best of the move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do a lot of different types of work. Um, you do uh, still life and portraits and kind of documentary style photography and travel. Uh, do you have like a favorite type of work? I don't. I don't. I don't. I feel like um, I, I, I call myself a journeyman, you know, um, a lot because I, I feel like I have a good handle on the tools and, um, uh, you know, a good uh, methodology with the equipment. So I'm, I'm more inspired by, you know, what I'm going to work on next rather than what I just finished, for instance. Um, so um, I, I try to, I try to do things that make me happy, that excite me and, and hopefully, um, you know, give the viewer some, some interesting things to look at, but um, I, I don't really, I'm not interested in specializing. It, it would, it, you know, I don't know, two or three portraits is great, but uh, if I'm doing that for six or seven months or a long time, it, it, it feels like for me, it needs to be more varied than that. So. We know that travel is uh, real important to you. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, my first trip uh, out of, Berkeley and, and Oakland was when I was uh, 17 or 18. And um, I took an airline trip from probably Oakland International at that point to DC. And man, it was just, it just opened my eyes up to the prospect of doing more of that stuff. And um, I've been traveling ever since. When I was working, a large part of my um, career was, was involving a lot of domestic and international travel. So at the highlight of my career, I was traveling one week out of every month um, around the US and, uh, and Europe. And I loved it. It was fantastic. And so um, I just, I got the bug that, uh, you know, that work travel was a, was a way to uh, satisfy the bug. And uh, my wife and I do a lot of travel now um just because we enjoy doing it it's to me you know I, I call it getting off the block and i think it's super important to to get off the, the metaphorical block and see you know what they're doing over there and see how they're doing things over there i remember one of the fir first times i went to a hardware store in paris it just blew my mind to see these mundane things like door locks and you know window locks and and how the execution of those things was so different there than they are here functionality was absolutely the same but different approaches you know beautiful aesthetic um things in hardware stores so it, it's kind of weird but i love that kind of stuff and um yeah it just i i just really enjoy travel it, it uh, i can't imagine the life without it you know well, some of their doorways are pretty different over in Paris as well. Uh, so speaking of that, uh, you took the picture 59 Rue de Rivoli, uh, which we are using as uh, an image for our puzzle, yeah. um, on a trip to Paris in 2015. Yeah. Um, 
What do you know about 59 Rue de Rivoli? We hear that it changes, the, the storefront and the doorway changes every few months or something like that. Have you seen it change? Um, and, and what do you know about that? You know, it, it, it um, well, it's not like I'm looking at it every month. If I'm lucky, I'll see it, you know, once a year and, and then subtract the COVID uh, pandemic time out of that. But um, it, it the door actually changes more subtly than um, the space above it. it. So this this area um, of Rue de Rivoli is a is a high street, a main you know main boulevard in in central Paris. And the what what happens is there is a commercial space at the bottom um, where this front door is, fifty nine Rue de Rivoli, and then there may be another commercial space on the second floor. But then above that will be um, living quarters, apartments, or in the case of 59 uh, Rue de Rivoli, um, an art uh, collective. And so um, the actual door changes more subtly. And they paint it every now and then. But they do. There's always some really interesting artwork coming out of the, the, the building um, above these commercial spaces. And that changes pretty dramatically, and I think probably more frequently than the actual um, front door. But if, if I try to get by there every time I'm in town just to see what's going on over there. And interestingly enough, you know, I never, never once thought about trying to get in to the collective and to say hello and to introduce myself. It didn't come up until somebody else, I was talking to them um, about the puzzle, um, somebody I know you know, got the puzzle and we were talking about the backstory and all that stuff. And they said, well, what goes on in the collective? And I said, I have no idea. I never, never thought to approach them. And and you know what, as I'm talking about this, um, I'm going to be in Paris in November for a Paris photo. And I think I ought to take a couple of puzzles with me. Um, I think that's a great I, idea. You know what? I'm just, I'm just like, pondering it as it comes out of my mouth. I think that'd be a great, uh, a great gift, a great thing to do. And it would get me in the front door. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So, you know, one of the neat things about that photograph is all of the detail, you know, yeah. and how, how different it is from square inch to square inch or even less. Yeah. I'm a big uh, Chuck Close fan. And, you know, some of his paintings are made up of smaller individual abstract pieces of art, but then they come together in a big picture as a, you know, a portrait or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, one of the neat things about being a puzzle maker is breaking down physically, literally uh, dissecting an image and then appreciating each little piece as its own kind of work of art. Mm -hmm. And none of our puzzles do that as well as yours. It's, mm. oh, it's so you. fun. I'm going to put some puzzle pieces up on the screen as examples um, for folks to see what I'm talking about, because it's just a pleasure to um, see all of the individual, you know, details and, and stuff. Um, what are your favorite details of uh, that image? Um, I have it here. I, well, the, the color schemes, the, the choice of colors, um, just so so vivid and so so you know varied i love that yeah and the thing i the, the the one element that i like um a lot and we haven't put this puzzle together yet um but i'm interested in doing that up in the upper left corner there are some um figures some faces three or four faces up there staring back at you know somebody on the street and that little area really intrigues me because it's it's a little bit creepy and you know uh, a little bit, uh, you know, suggestive of what may be happening behind the door. So I think of, of all of the areas that that area interests me the most. You know, it looks like somebody's trying to open up, you know, an area with the hands and all of that stuff. So that yeah, that, kind of a breaking cool. the fourth wall kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. exactly. Has uh, now that your image is turned into a puzzle, has that changed the way you see the image? And do you think that putting the puzzle together I know. How do you think you're going to feel about that? We're looking forward to doing it. We're actually going to have a puzzle party. So uh, it's going to be a group effort and we're excited about doing it. Yeah. Great. 
Um, one of the things that is the most exciting to us is promoting the work of our artists. Um, we love your Black Farmers project called Still Here, and we will link that uh, in the description below. Um, when did you start working on that, and what are your future goals for that? I started working on that in 2016, and um, it was inspired by a podcast I heard. Um, I don't know if they still do it, but uh, at the time on NPR, there was a podcast called Reveal, and uh, the host was Al Litson. And, and Al did a story um, about um, an African-American farmer in North Carolina. His name is Eddie Wise. And it was a story about how Mr. Wise lost his farm um, to repossession, uh, you know, after years and years of trying to to run it and sustain it, um, he finally lost it. Um, and I, it made me think about, it was a very touching, very moving story about um, Eddie Wise and his his wife. And, you know, she I think she passed away during the course of all of this um, all these events leading up to their loss of that their, their land. But it made me think about my grandfather, um, who was a farmer in South Louisiana. And his story was a little bit different from um, Eddie Wise's story, because my grandfather was a successful um, sugarcane farmer. And he, he did sugarcane, and he did pecans, and he, he did other, um, other produce. But um, he was successful uh, for a long time. He had a, a ready-made... Um, crew uh, and he, he and his brothers farmed together. So uh, that might have been part of the reason for their success, I guess, you know, family operation. But um, the contrast between Eddie Wise and my grandpa just made me start thinking about that. And I just felt like um, someone needed to, to go out there and document what African-American farmers are doing. And uh, so I developed this solo project. I uh, between 2016 and uh, well, COVID put a put a pin in it. Um, I think the last farm I went to before COVID was in late 2019, and then uh, I've only been to one more um, in 2022. Ironically, here in Georgia, over in Savannah, um, so I had to you know put a little bit of um, time uh, between me and and doing the work uh, because of COVID. Um, but I just I wanted to show the imagery of of, of African -Amer American farmers. They make huge contributions, and um, you know some unsung um, stories, unsung heroes, um, and heroines that I wanted to highlight. And so that's what that was all about. Um, I have some new imagery from the project on my new website, uh, GeneDominique.com. And in color. Um, the, the original project was a black and white project. And so I've done some new um, some new editing and, and I have a couple of farms that weren't in the original project there. So um, it's it's in hiatus. Um, I don't know the answer to what happens next. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to visit more farms or start working on the book phase of it. But ultimately, I'd like to develop it into a, a photo book. Wow, that's great. And I'm excited to see the new photographs. Yeah. Are there any yeah, other projects? Yeah, gmail.com. Absolutely. Yeah. And we will link that in the description below as well so people can uh, Cool, cool, cool. Um, are there any other projects that you're working on right now or any future plans for projects that you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't have any projects right now going on. I'm very proud of a portfolio show that um, I had over at the Southeastern Center for Photography in uh, July and August. Um, it's still available to see online at their website, but I was very happy. Um, they showed 10 of my photographs from a still life series. Um, it's called um, the Time Life Series of Photography Reimagined. Um, in the 70s, 1970s, there was a, a pretty comprehensive series of books, 17 of them, um, distributed by Time Life, uh, called Time Life Series of Photography. It was, uh, you know, kind of a reference point for photographers back then. Um, they used it in classrooms. Um, people coveted the, the series. You know, you, you, you it was one of the, the things you had to have um, 
if you called yourself a competent photographer. And I reimagined the, the books as abstract pieces, sculptural pieces. Um, and so I was really happy um, when uh, Mike Paneer decided to show them. And it's a group show, um, 10 of them, 10, 10 of my photographs. So I was very proud about that. It's not up anymore, but you can still see it online. It's online. Yeah, yeah. They have a they have a section at the website for past exhibitions. And so the photographs came down um, about a week ago, okay. but they're still online, still available to see online. Right, right. Sounds good. Um, well, we're excited for um, the puzzle. Uh, you know, we've uh, had a lot of uh, customers writing to us and, and letting us know how much they've enjoyed it and they're taking pictures of, you know, the finished puzzle and, and stuff like that. So it's it's been a oh, real that's great. That makes me so happy. That's cool. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, really enjoyable image. Um, and we're looking forward to the book version of uh, Still Here. Um, so we'll look forward to that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate oh, it. Oh, you're welcome, Dave. This has been fun. Thanks. All right, Gene. Take care. Thanks. Cheers.